What happens when you put CDN edge deployments, HTTP caching, and authentication together? All three of these things are complicated to set up on their own. You have to really make sure you know what you're doing, what kind of architecture trade-offs you're making, what weird edge cases that you might run into, and so much more. So when you try to put three complicated things together, you'll probably run into a whole new class of issues and edge cases that you've probably never seen before. You unlock a whole new category of disasters that you now have to deal with. And that's exactly what happened to Loom last week. Loom is a platform for recording video and screen capture that can easily be shared with teammates, with customers, and so on. On March 7th, Loom had an incident that was causing account vulnerability. Basically, users were reporting that they were getting automatically logged out of their account, but also automatically logged in to someone else's account. So imagine, when I log into Loom, not only am I immediately logged out somehow, but I'm also immediately and automatically logged in into your Loom account without even doing anything. That was the issue that users were reporting with Loom. After declaring an incident, the Loom team probably spent about 30 minutes on the issue before realizing just how bad it was getting. And at that point, they had to take down the entire service and even roll back database updates. This was 11.30 a.m. in the morning, which is probably like the peak time for Loom users to use their service and record videos. The service was brought back up at about 2.45 p.m., which is more than three hours of downtime. That's how serious and complicated this issue was. So in this video, I'm going to try to break down exactly what happened and how we might run into weird issues like these when we try to put multiple complicated architectures together. This video is only supposed to be an analysis of the issue, and I absolutely don't intend on demeaning or defaming the Loom engineering team at all. They have put a lot of effort into not only actively dealing with this issue, but also being very transparent about this whole thing. The entire reason this video is even possible is because the CTO of Loom decided to write a very detailed article about the entire incident. I will link the article in the description. Please show them nothing but love. We are all engineers. We are all humans. We cannot make everything perfect all the time. So to try to explain what was happening visually, I'm going to use this video sponsor, Eraser. More on them later. Let's start by trying to understand how their CDN caching works. I'm going to use Eraser's diagram as code feature and make a sequence diagram. I'm going to get rid of all of this. And let's say we have a user who's trying to communicate with a server. Now, when I first log into Loom, it's going to download the asset files or the JavaScript, HTML, CSS files that are needed to run the application. Let's say that the first request is for some sort of a JavaScript bundle bundle.js. Most applications use a content delivery network. This request is act uh, actually being made against a CDN, which then actually communicates to our application server and makes the same request for the same bundle or the same assets. Then the server responds to the CDN with the bundle file, at which point the CDN can then respond back to the user with the bundle file, like that. Now here, CDN is basically just acts acting as a proxy, so we're not getting much value out of it. The value is in the cache. So let me demonstrate it here. When we first make a request for a bundle or for anything to a CDN, the CDN will first check its cache. It'll try to request bundle.js from the cache. The cache might respond to the CDN with a miss or with a not found. A cache miss is basically when something that you're looking for in a cache is not there. So in this example, when the bundle is not found in the cache, then the CDN will make a request to the server requesting for the bundle. Once it gets it back, it's going to store it in its cache, store bundle.js, and then it's going to return it. Oops, this is supposed to be the CDN. The CDN will store it in the cache, and then finally it will return it to the user. The value of doing this is that, let's say there is a user2, and the user2 makes the same request to the CDN for request bundle.js. At this point, the CDN once again will check the cache, request 
bundle.js. I probably should have picked a name that's easier to type, but this time the cache will not respond with a not found. It will send back the bundle to the CDN, like so. And now the CDN can simply respond to the user too with bundle.js. So you see the CDN only had to reach out to the application once in the beginning. It did not have to reach out to the application server once again because the bundle is cached here. This cache is going to be local to the CDN server, so it's going to be much faster to request it from a cache than to request it from the application server. To make this better, let's give it an order. Let's put user2 here and let's put user. Now you can see clearly that as long as the asset being requested is stored in the cache, the CDN can simply return it instead of having to reach out to the server. It only has to do this if it's not found in the cache. So now that we have a decent understanding of how the CDN cache works, let's see how their authentication works. I'm going to make a new diagram here. Once again, diagram as code and sequence. Let's get rid of all of these. And let's say that this time I'm not requesting for an asset, but I'm requesting data. So let's say request data. Now this time we don't need to hit the CDN because even though the requests are going through the CDN, the CDN is not supposed to cache anything because this is user data. This has to be fresh whenever I request it and it has to be unique to my ID. So it's not really possible to cache it. So we can ignore the CDN for now. However, what we cannot ignore is the cookie. When we make a request for some data to an application server, we have to present our identity to it. Most web applications use cookies for authentication, which means when I'm sending an HTTP request to a server for data, I'm going to send a cookie with it. Now, what does the server do with this cookie? Great question. The server probably has some sort of a session store where every cookie is related to a session object. So the server is going to request session for cookie. The session can at this point or the session store at this point can come back to the server with not found, which basically means that the cookie is invalid, which means I need to log in again. At this point, the server will probably redirect me to the login page saying that, hey, you're trying to access a page that is protected, but you're not logged in, so you need to log in. So let's instead uh, look at the scenario where it comes back successfully with the session object. Now the server knows who I am because the session object has my user ID, it probably has my role or any other authentication information that the server might need. At this point, the server can go to a database and request data. Oops, this needs to be a colon. Request data for user. Now, the user here probably comes from the session object. My user ID is stored in there. That's, the implementation is not super important, but the point is that the server can make the request for the data now that it has my user ID. Now the database will return to the server with the data that was requested, and the server can then return to the user with that data. Now along with returning the data, the server also sends a set cookie header. The set cookie header is a way for the server to tell the browser application, use this cookie the next time you're sending me a request. So let's say that the set cookie, let's call it two, and let's call this cookie one. The next time I request the server for some data, I'm going to request data plus cookie, and this is going to be two instead of one. So I'm now using this new cookie instead of the old one. Now there has to be a new cookie because before returning the data, the server reaches back to the session store and bumps my session. Now I don't really wanna get into too much details of why this is happening. The important part is that the server is doing something which results in a new cookie that it has to send me. And now I have to use this new cookie to send the next request. Okay, now that we also have a decent understanding of how their authentication works. Let's see what happens when they're both put together. This time I'm going to just clone this diagram so that we can work off of this. Now on March 7th, which is the date of the incident, Loom made some configuration changes to the CDN. 
And every time you hear the word configuration change, you should probably be a little on the edge about it. No pun intended. What started happening is that when the CDN made requests to the server for a bundle or for an asset right here, it was somehow also sending the cookie with it. Now, we just talked about what happens when the server sees the cookie in the request. Let's zoom out a bit and let's start to diagram this. The server is going to reach out to the session store and it's going to request for session with cookie. The session store, oops, session store will come back to the server with the session. Now at this point, you can imagine the server uh, reaches out to its file system and grabs the bundle.js file. We are not too concerned with showing that here right now. What we do need to show is that the server has to reach back out to the session store to bump the session. And when it responds back with the file, it's going to have the set cookie header because that's what the server is programmed to do when it receives a request with a cookie. It's as simple as that. So far, this is kind of expected behavior. It's not necessarily expected on uh, requesting assets. It's only expected to be there when you're requesting data, but it's still happening. This is where things get really interesting. Now we have to talk a little bit about how this cache works. This is an HTTP cache that lives on the CDN server. It's only an HTTP layer cache. It does not see what's inside HTTP requests or responses, which means when it's storing this bundle.js file right here, it's not just storing that file, it's storing the entire response object that it gets from the server. It's going to cache the bundle.js file with the set cookie header. Oh my God, I cannot type. You can probably start to see why this is a bit of a problem, but let's keep going. The CDN gets back to us with the set cookie header and all is good. The set cookie header is still mine and I can continue to use this application as intended. Let's see what happens when user two requests for bundle.js. So user two hits the CDN, CDN hits the cache. The cache responds back to the CDN with the bundle.js file and the set cookie header because once again this is an http layer cache it can cache entire http response objects it doesn't have any knowledge of what's going on inside those objects or what file is in there or what json data is in there it's going to cache everything including the headers which means user 2 gets back the bundle but with my cookie or with user 1's cookie Let's imagine I am user one and you are user two. I went through this whole flow. I got my bundle.js and I got my cookie. But what happened was that my cookie was cached on the CDN server, which means when you requested the bundle file, you received my cookie with the bundle. And we know what happens when the front end application received the set cookie header. It starts using this new cookie which means you are now using my cookie, which is supposed to be unique to me, which is supposed to represent me to the server, which means the next time you make a request to the server, you're going to use my cookie and you're going to see my data. You're going to see my name. Chaotic, isn't it? This is why users were reporting that they are getting logged out of their account and logged into someone else's, because that is literally what is happening. The application gets rid of their existing cookie and uses this new cookie that it got from the CDN, which does not even belong to this user. If you were the second person to request an asset from the CDN, you were getting the cookie of whoever last requested an asset from that CDN because their cookie is cached on the CDN, which means there might be a hundred users that are talking to the same CDN who are all probably seeing the same person's account. Beyond this, let's talk about something that probably made it a little worse. The CDN cache here was configured to clear itself after one second, which means when the first user requests a bundle and it goes to the server, this cache here is only stored for one second, which means only for the next second, anyone hitting the CDN is going to be logged in as that one user. However, as soon as that second passes, this cache is cleared up. There is suddenly a new bundle.js that gets stored in there that has probably someone else's cookie. 
So after after one second or after a few seconds, you'll probably be logged out of this new person's account again and be logged into someone else's account once again. You can probably see now why they had to take down this service for three hours at peak times. It really was not a small issue, but thankfully the issue is all fixed and resolved now and we can continue to use Loom without being accidentally logged into someone else's account. I should probably also clarify that I don't work at Loom or I don't have a lot of inside knowledge on their architecture. So a lot of things that I mentioned in this video could be slightly inaccurate, but I think the root issue of the bundle being cached on the CDNs with the cookie headers is really the root cause of this whole incident. So if there were any mistakes in my representation of this architecture, I, I apologize. I reached out to their CTO for additional questions, but he was understandably very busy dealing with customers and uh, all the complaints and requests or whatever. So once again, I don't mean any hate towards Loom or their engineering team. Please show them nothing but love. I hope this video was helpful in trying to understand how some of these complex architectures can interact with each other and make life more difficult. I also want to give a big thanks to the people behind Eraser for not only building such an amazing tool that helped me visualize all of this, but also for bringing this incident to my attention in the first place. Eraser is a diagrams and documentation hub for engineering teams. Since launching in March of 2021, hundreds of thousands of users have used Eraser to draw architecture diagrams, create technical planning documentation, conduct whiteboard interviews, and sketch wireframes. Eraser differentiates with developer targeted features like markdown notes, diagram as code, and keyboard first flowcharting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one.